go. I guess so. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> this is Cindy, <laughs> and I am with Jeannie Zandy again. I'm so grateful. Hi, Jeannie. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Jeannie Zandy, founder of Living as Love and JeannieZandy.com. Jeannie offers amazing opportunities to come together in presence and just come to the reality of what's here now and how do we relate to that? How do we relate to now and presence? We're going to talk about that. And I'm grateful that you let me pick the topic because I've been yeah. sharing with Jeannie that I've been hosting a group and our focus has been on just sitting in presence and really acclimating ourselves to that and tracking how it's showing up in our reality and sharing our experiences to give that more bandwidth through our awareness every day and everything we do. And you're such an expert at this through direct experience. Um, so I'd love to have you share with us whatever wants to be known. Well, let's see. There's always something. <laughs> it's, it's so lovely. There's some novel, I can't remember what it is. I think it's by Tom Robbins, where the character has a big thumb and she discovers that her purpose in life is to hitchhike. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a talker. <laughs> and no matter what, what it is, if it's some kind of juicy spiritual topic, human topic, um, there seems to always be something there to say about it. It's so funny. So presence, you know, there's been so much in the past however many years with, you know, uh, Eckhart Tolle and Byron Katie and Adya Shanti and all these teachers becoming famous, you know, in on the national stage. It seems like even my neighbors have gone to an Adya retreat, you know, these kind of things. And so it's become really a household word. And many, many people are are talking about it or advertising it. And yet it's this thing that is invisible, that we can't point to, we can't grab, we can't touch with our minds. We can read lots about it and sort of memorize what all the amazing teachers say about it. But it, when it comes to bringing it into practicality, which is the way that I'm interested in teaching, it's like if we can't get this in, you know, in our everyday, then really what good is it, you know? And so presence is kind of this magical word, like consciousness, you know, these words, it's like, oh, you know, that's spiritual. <laughs> but presence, what does presence mean? It means that we are something, when something is present, it is. That's it. The pen is, isness. Being, being and presence sort of go along with each other. And if our mind checks and says, well, am I? Do I be? Am I present? Um, what's really interesting is if we go up to the head, we're like, well, duh, I'm here and you're here. And so, hi, we're present. <laughs> it's kind of the, the topical bit, but I'm I'm going to keep going here. <laughs> This is going somewhere. I don't know where, but I always go along for the ride as I watch it. <laughs> no feeling. <laughs> so generally our generally our focus is on what I would call objects that pepper presence, that fill the moment. And the objects can be something like a pen. They can be something like a sense object, like I'm hot right now. They can be a mind object, like I'm thinking about my Aunt Mary right now or my list of things to do. And the space of the moment, the field of the moment, you could call it a field, just has all this stuff in it. And we are very much taught to focus on the stuff and even think of ourselves as one of the one of the things, one of the bits. So there's a, a Cindy bit and there's a genie bit. But be sometimes we call it uh, us spiritual teachers who are pointing to presence. It's nearly comical because it's like it's right there. 
it's right there. And I remember I used to sit in uh, satsangs, which are a form of spiritual meeting. I'd be like, where, where? <laughs> she says, it's right here. Where? <laughs> um, and it's what's looking. It's the space within which all the stuff is happening. And that is a, a mind bender. Uh, like oftentimes when teachers talk about presence, we talk about how like my eye cannot see itself. Presence or consciousness cannot see itself, but we can become aware that we are aware that we're here and we're noticing. I like to call it noticing. And there's something about taking our attention off of the objects of thought or off of the pens or off of the Cindy's and the genies, stepping back, uh, Rumi calls it, uh, fall toward the glass blower's breath. You could see this is the holy like blowing everything into existence. And it's stepping back into what's looking to abide there. The trick is that our minds are so busy that we generally try to look with our minds instead of our direct experience. And partly, um, we could use some of us a bit of practice in direct experience below thought, below the mind. So for example, um, if you taste a strawberry and you just are purely in the experience of strawberry and there's a thought in your mind, there's just this taste of strawberry, that's direct experience. You're not thinking about a strawberry. Someone's not telling you about a strawberry. You're not picturing a strawberry. You don't even know what strawberry is at this level. It's just this experience. So direct experience is stripped of thoughts about it. And uh, this is why in my teaching, I do a lot of inviting people down out of a focus on thought objects into the flow of direct experience, the feel of breath, the feel of weight, the feel of breeze on the face. And you can notice as I speak this, um, if you follow that, you start to get a little bit high, <laughs> let's say, <laughs> or you can <laughs> not, not let's say again, <laughs> or low, or, or low. Yeah, exactly. Down and in. <laughs> yeah. And whenever, uh, thought objects and having our attention fused to thought objects, generally has us kind of buried in a world created by thought. And we actually don't know generally that there is another world. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so uh, some teaching methods um, will try to assist someone to experience a gap in their thinking. Some of the famous pointers are things like, you know, what happens between the thoughts, you know, between tick and talk, you know, what is there really inviting people to start to abide or rest outside of the mind in a direct experience of this present presence that we are. I'm going to pause because there's a lot to say about this and I want to mm -hmm see where where you're at with what i'm saying and what you're thanks. noticing thanks for yeah leading us into this what i hear you saying or what's hanging out with me here in this is there is presence experiencing through us but i often we try to get a direct experience of that presence through the personality and that doesn't that that's not the experience what you're saying is experience presence as presence not try to experience through the construct of the personality it's kind of like when you're tasting the strawberry and you're fully there with the strawberry 
that's presence. But if you're tasting the strawberry and that's direct experience, but you're thinking you're comparing it to another strawberry you ate somewhere else, then that's getting colluded by thought personality. Right. So right. And it's really tricky because, and this is a good thing for everyone to know, you know, we have been conditioned to fuse our attention to our thought stream. We have been heavily conditioned for our raw attention that in a baby is just free and open and receiving whatever's in the environment to fuse it to thought so much that we can barely have an experience without uh, the sports announcer of the mind being laminated right on it. And so when we first play in the fields of presence and questioning who we are and this sort of thing. Um, I just want to say like to everyone, don't worry about it, that your mind is doing its thinking. It's just going to do that. And to have an experience, I mean, it can happen to anyone. It can happen without a teacher, uh, sometimes deep in a meditation retreat there can be a lot of support that allows us to glimpse ourselves outside of thought because we don't have to pay our bills, drive to work, respond to our partner, to our children, to our coworkers. We've set aside this time and we're often supported by the immense presence of a teacher because uh, one of the things that, um, one of the things that 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 happens is that I don't know how to describe this, but it's sort of like presence grows fat to the degree <laughs> that our attention starts to come off of the objects of thought and abide in presence. And we can we can some of us who are sensitive, we can feel that when we're in the presence of a teacher that all of their all of what would go out and up and over and into sort of personal neuroticism and stuff is just available. Their presence is just available. We can feel like we're being seen through. We can feel like they're shining or we can feel drunk because this uh, instrument is so open to its essential suchness rather than splintered into a million pieces that are all trying to maintain a mind born world. Right. Um, and so uh, in my experience, um, it was like, there's a gap between thoughts, let's say, or there's a moment where we hear a bird or we taste a strawberry. And for a moment, we are just outside of thought, just abiding. We can have this experience just it's grace that it that it comes. Um, and as we give our attention to that, as we turn toward and become curious, it's as though it responds. And that tiny gap grows into a way of life so much that presence becomes more real than the objects or than the mind created life. And this is sort of the, um, once I joked, someone asked me, how are you experiencing the holy right now? And I said, as a benevolent smirk, because mm -hmm. there is this being in the life, in the life showing up as a person with a name and an address and these kind of things. But deeply known is that this whole play is very much secondary to this that I am, which is presence. And that uh, there starts to be the capacity, you know, Adyashanti calls it, can you be aware that you're aware? Mm -hmm. There starts to be the capacity to sort of uh, drop back out of the life, um, even while you're in life. It's sort of like, you're playing a part, you're playing it well. You're not telling anybody that unless you're teaching, 
you know, I, I don't go to the like car repair place and say, you know, this is all, this is all a story and a myth. And I'm really just playing a character. Hello, I'm presence. And so are you like, I don't do that, but I may have a moment at the counter where it's like, oh my God, this game is so dear that I get to be this and you get to be that. And we play this and that. And really it's this remarkable, essential presence. Um, you know, it's all happening in this much deeper, more root uh, isness than the story the mind tells about what's actually going on. And so you see a lot of teachers who are no longer getting excited about the particular tragedies of life or the difficulties of life or the traffic jams. It's just like, this is what this isness, this is how the isness is ising right now. And uh, it's, and it's a play and you can feel the play, which doesn't make one run around sort of telling people, you know, stop your suffering dummy. It's all pretend that's not useful. That's not in my teaching book, a useful way to approach human beings. Um, but there is a levity and an ability to, ab- it's like, you don't have to tell someone you abide there. And suddenly a whole room that might've been dooming out about something starts to lighten up a little bit because there's at least one being in the room who has a deeper uh, view I guess is the best way to say it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it reminds me of the Rumi poem about the the field out beyond the ideas of right doing and wrong doing. There's a field, I'll meet you there. And I love, you know, anytime the word field is mentioned, you know, we think of a field of grass or whatever, but for me, it's an energy field. It's a state. That's what I'm talking about, what you're talking about. Yeah, so this field you know, there's a field of presence around us all the time. And there's the denser field that we can get trapped into in the miredness of the identity and role and so forth. But when we, like you say, put attention on the presence, there is, there's a, and it's done consistently for my experience is it becomes more attractive than the distractions of the mind, which used to be a, an attraction, right? the shiny objects and the promises of something better in the future. And then the more presence builds, the less attractive those, those poles are. And you just start noticing that you're attracted to different things or you're not as attracted to certain things. Yeah. As that presence builds. So I was going to share with you um, before we started recording, we decided to wait how this showed up yesterday in a group I lead with one of the participants who um, was just reporting in and casually said, usually I wake up in the morning and I turn on the Today Show, but she said, I decided not to. A Today Show, right? (laughs) Yeah. There's a Today Show on TV, but there's a Today Show called Today. Today. Yeah, there was a Today (laughs) Show in her garden. She decided to go out in her garden instead and she saw a hummingbird moth for the first time. And she was just in awe over this incredible creature that was there waiting for her. And yeah. she had to make the choice to not tune into the television, but to tune into what was present in her own field. The real news. Yeah. And and Rumi speaks of this also when he encourages us. I, I don't know the poem in my mind, but he encourages us you know, don't go back to sleep, pick up a musical instrument, like don't go to your books or whatever, pick up a musical instrument, let the beauty you love be what you do. It's like the participation in the play, the, the playful entry into what Uh, the animals and the birds and the trees that they're all here and they're all expressing their essence in these simple ways. And we can be so complicated and so serious about getting somewhere else. And sometimes I feel like the trees are just all standing around waiting for us to join the party (laughs) (laughs) by taking an instrument. An instrument is such, I mean, we can play an instrument in a lot of ways, 
but to be with the strings of the guitar, hearing the sounds, being in the right brain in this direct enjoyment of the moment allows us to join kind of the festival of the moment, which is, um, you know, presence and uh, presence as we turn toward it, as we discover it, as we uh, surrender to it and learn how to abide in it, it feeds us. And, you know, we read about the bliss and this and that. Um, there's a, and I'm, I'm speaking from it right now. And this is how I like to teach, to speak from it. Or even when we're speaking about it, to speak from it, from the way that the body surrendered to presence, the hum in the heart, the hum in the cells, um, that there's this, when, when we're abiding in it, there's this constant bubbling well-being, joy. It's as though life itself is just saying, yay, yay, yay. And that doesn't mean that hard things don't happen. It doesn't mean that you don't stub your toe. In fact, sometimes you might be more likely to stub your toe because you're <laughs> <laughs> starting to not watch where you're walking because you're all, <laughs> um, but there's, there's something, and this is what we're all after, right? The end of suffering the firmly abiding in the present moment carefree, not because we aren't paying our bills, but because we are in touch with and experiencing the utter reliability that things as they are will be as they are, and that arguing with it is a fool's activity <laughs> and makes us miserable. And yet to really be willing to say yes to whatever happens here on earth, you know, as the small me that's so afraid of this and that, afraid that we can't handle this or that, you know, no amount of worrying has ever uh, kept tomorrow from coming, so to speak. And tomorrow never comes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Such a paradox. Exactly. Both, both are right. Yeah. <laughs> I remember dropping into presence really um, in a tangible way with you about eight years ago at a retreat. And um, it felt like the energy, the best I could describe it at the time was it felt like being a big cat where you're just sitting there and there's a presence peering through you, right? It, it was just that lazy, not lazy, but you know, with the big cat energy, they rest and digest most of their time and then they hunt when they have to. So they do the yang energy when it's necessary to feed themselves and to play as part of the pride and so forth. But then otherwise they're resting and digesting. So they're very yin creature. And here we as humans have become conditioned to be so yang that we don't even know how to rest. And most of us have not given ourselves permission to rest. And it's what we realized yesterday, we, we were bathing in the presence and then we came out of our practice and um, we didn't want to move, right? We we're just sitting in that sort of um, anchored state of here and now. So we had to do a yang practice to get ourselves up and, you know, ready to move on to the next thing. So both are needed is basically what I'm saying yin and yang are both needed and um, the balancing of it is is um, individual I believe for for everyone and that the culture has been so conditioned to be yang that we're these are your words we're hungry for yin we're starving for yin yeah. and this is presence well yin it's um I used to think of being as yin, but being is being. Yin is the softening down into being. Mm. And then yang is the out of the empty zero of being comes a green shoot, comes a movement of true action, true word. Mm. And the less afraid we are 
of softening down into resting is nothing, the less afraid we are of that, the more we can give ourselves to that, the more true and clear the the right movement, the holy impulse is that rises. And this is what, like to me, uh, the yin of meditation, when you sit down on your cushion, it's like soften, sink, surrender to what is. This is all yin. Ah. And the yang of meditation is, well, here comes a juicy thought stream that wants to take me away. No, back down. The no, thank you. That's yang. It's like a, a limit, a boundary. Nope. Back, back to softening. Ah, soften, soften, soften. And here, you know, I like to talk about um, what I call false yang, which is uh, yang is a movement up and out into creation, into activity. And that creation or activity can be fueled by fear. Like, wow, I really feel like I need to rest into being right now, but oh my gosh, my taxes aren't done. (gasps) Or Oh, I, I really want to rest into being. This feels just so good and so right. But my mom and dad told me I need to stay busy or else I suck. What's wrong with me? So <laughs> I can see the, the fuel of that doing mm-hmm. is fear or uh, some kinds of fuel for doing or things like attachment. Like I'm very attached to what you think about me. So I'm going to hurry up and get a master's and a PhD and lots of letters after my name so I can be someone which is not rising from my true essence or being, but is rising from the fuel of being afraid of being a nobody and then not having love and getting left out to die or whatever. (laughs) And so uh, the embodiment, we, we hear the word embodiment a lot, the embodiment of awakening, the embodiment of presence. And, uh, the Buddhists call it synchronizing body and mind, where uh, we start to listen deeper than the false fuels of becoming, of fear, of attachment. We watch them come and go, just what the Buddha was doing under the Bodhi tree. Come on, buddy, move, and you'll get riches. Move, and you. And if you don't move, you'll get the and all that. It's like watching it, watching it, watching it, abiding, abiding. And then you feel uh, the true movement, which feels a lot like matter-of-fact necessity. If you've ever felt something that made no logical sense, but it was very clear that you should do it or say it, that's a holy impulse. And you can feel in your body as you become more acclimated to felt experience, you can feel the taste of those true impulses Versus the taste of things that is coming, that are coming from fear. Uh, one of the poets, Hafiz Sarumi, said, when we move from that funny place, it's like everything has a little bit of weird failure in it. And I always love that phrase, weird failure, that, that we are here to locate that holy will stream and to be utterly obedient to it because it's the painter of the painting themselves. It's the, it's our essence, just like a acorn becomes an oak tree. Uh, Whatever this is, has a seed of unfolding. It seems as I stay true, speak true, act truly. And then we more and more and deeper and deeper embody divine qualities um, because, because we're basically in love with that and tired of anything else. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes yes and the softening um you know my experience and everything is related of course and so because my attention is largely on qigong and the practice of removing stagnation from the body to increase the flow of energy and you have a background in aikido so you understand as well the energetics of this is uh those ideas of um, chasing after something, right, are stagnation. They are patterns that block not only the flow of chi, but the flow of information and the connection to the source of what is rising up and to be known and expressed. And um, 
my two favorite quotes happen to be from theoretical physicists, David Bohm and Carl Sagan. I've probably shared this with you before, but David Bohm says consciousness or awareness is seeking a form that allows its fullest expression. And Carl Sagan says somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. <laughs> and I love to combine those quotes and say consciousness is seeking a form that allows something incredible to be known. And it's our role, my personally, I, I believe it's our role to allow that something that wants to be known through us to reveal itself and to gather the, the resources and the people around that are, are here to support that in coming out and into the world, like a midwifing kind of experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the more it's really the, the false scent, the false self and the belief in what's false crumbles, washes to the sea of being, and then up out of that resting sea of being becomes in a way the new life. This is why they call it being born again. It's like you're living from a completely different place and seeking for every footfall to be aligned with what's most authentic and true. And then the life unfolds um, in, a, in a free and beautiful way. It may not be the mind's idea of beautiful, especially as the old structures shaking out, there can be a lot of conflict and a lot of just not knowing as we transition from brain as God <laughs> to God as God. Yeah. Reminds me of rockets where, you know, they have a certain um, engine. I don't know all the proper terms, but that part helps it get out beyond the atmosphere and then it drops uh -huh. away. And the <laughs> so we need that, that ego and that individuality to separate from the mother and to have that unique direction and experience in life. And then at some point it needs to fall away for the, the true seed to emerge and the sprouts to find their way. There does seem to be, you know, in kind of exploring yin and yang, there does seem to be a way that the holy builds structure. It builds structures. It builds nests. It builds wombs. It, it builds things. And then it often takes them apart, lets them rot. You know, the compost pile is filled with structures that are my compost pile. I just stuck something in it that that are being broken down into the building blocks again. And there is something when we stay true, stay true, stay true. And wow, if we've been allowed to mature wide open, not losing our in-touchness with presence, with our own essence, there is a structure. It's like an energetic structure, but it's also like in the body, the capacities the capacity to express well, the capacity to act clearly, you know, all these capacities we build, this instrument is build, built and matures and has some, my hands are doing all kinds of things, has some sense of integrity and wholeness and function. And when that integrity, wholeness and function is built from each step being true, Mm -hmm. it's sturdy, it's flexible, it's in line with divine qualities, you know, it's, it's just, it's in harmony, these kind of things. And, and uh, sometimes I have this sort of vision of the kind of system, I call it an energy management system, the conditioned system that we come out of our childhood conditioning with that has all these illogical shoots and ladders and methods and strategies and ways to blow off steam and things we can do and things we can't do and things we better not do or we'll be a bad one and things we won't do because, you know, all that, that it's this amazing contraption. Sometimes I laugh to myself picturing 
something like, I think in Monty Python, there used to be these crazy drawings. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen them, but these Monty crazy Python. drawings of these contraptions, maybe I'm just thinking of the surrealists or something. It's like, instead of simplicity and the flow, the clean flow of holy impulse of simplicity of expression, there's all these yes, no, this. So our life energy is rising up. And then part of our life energy is pushing it down because we're afraid to be a bad one and we can't go there. And the whole thing's unconscious. And so I had a mentor who said, um, you know, it's a really, it's, you have to do a lot of work to get to the point where you see just how bad it is. And, <laughs> and people realize, you know, when they, when they sort of have a big opening experience and then they look back at all their conditioning and they're like, what a mess. And I have to like live in this suit, <laughs> this weird too tight suit where I have all these patterns and things and, and I can't believe in them anymore, but unconsciously they're still firing and flowing. And uh, when, when the organizing principle is a me that's trying to be a good me, get approval, be beyond reproach and get to the promised land. When the organizing principle is that uh, things aren't as simple as when the organizing principle is simply the holy itself and its intrinsic plan, so to speak, it's intrinsic coherence and integrity. Yeah. Beautiful. And that's great because it really brings up that uh, question for me. I think that's been hovering See if I can put it into words. Um, so the true nature and uh, identity, I'll use that word, is presence. And then there's the construct and the contortions of the complex and the patterns and the identity that the presence is expressing through and into the world. Yeah. So is it, is the teachings about it's both and right i mean we transcend and include because we have to have the structure it doesn't have to be the contorted one that's li so limiting that suffocates the creative flow but there still has to be a structure that presence moves through and into the world right so even it's both think and. About, even if we just think about language and we think about prior prior to language as little beings you know yeah we're doing fine right because someone's taking care of us but as a mature being it really helps be able to say to say please pass the tomatoes or please pass the salt or or whatever and when you see the kind of scaffolding of the mind and the body, the mouth able to form these things, the mind able to memorize letters that make words, the sophisticated use of words, you can feel that there is a structure to that. There's an understanding of grammar to that. There's a, a fleshing out of something in the human that has that capacity. And when we wake up, we don't normally just lose all of our capacity for language. But now the language, the capacity, the structure gets whittled down. It's like the false is unnecessary. The false takes too much energy. We may start to use language differently. We may stop talking about all these kind of uh, juicy gossip stories. We may lose complete interest in that capacity serving something false, it may start to adhere more to serving what's beautiful. But the structure itself, however we think about the structure, we can we can feel we have bones. <laughs> we can also feel this the that something here has a structure and a coherence to be able to use language or to be able to mature into, uh, for example, effectively using, you know, uh, an electric drill or these kind of, or to, to drive a car, you know, there's, there's some, and Suzuki Roshi, somebody asked him about ego. He said, you, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously he said something like, um, 
how much someone said, how much ego do you need or something like this? And he said, you need enough ego to not get hit by a truck. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, and the capacity sure do come in handy if we didn't know how to walk and we didn't know how to talk. And we, we, as far as I can tell, we're here to extend heaven, to extend the holy through our word and our deed and our play and our joy and our art and our service. And the sharper the tool, you know, the better it cuts in a certain way. And so that can be a joy in itself. And I know there are a lot of artists and musicians who are serving in a way the God of music by how beautifully can I play this instrument? Given that I'm human, I have limitations. We're in time and space. How beautifully can I play these strings for that that I see that is so gorgeous to move through my fingers and this wood and this, you know, metal to express itself so that other beings recognize the sublime, you know, and that that's a different way of wanting to perfect. Mm -hmm. You're wanting to per perfect through devotion versus wanting to perfect because you're afraid someone will say you're a bad one and then you'll be open to criticism and have to die, you know? <laughs> yeah. Or perfecting for through for competition, right? To be best. It's more about aligning to that which is being expressed through. So it's this beautiful marriage of the form and the formless, right? And how it can move seamlessly. And that's so attractive when you encounter that in the world, isn't it? it? There's an attraction field to that, that we all sort of lean lean towards because that's what, what the big longing is for that lives inside of all of us. Yeah. So we, yeah. We, we want that. And then, of course, there's projections onto it if we're not letting ourselves have it or whatever. There's all kinds of gnarly stuff that happens when uh, projections come up, but that shows us too where, where those contortions are. Yeah. And that's the work of embodiment is bringing the unconscious structures that serve the false, that serve fear, that propagate division, um, bringing them to consciousness to meet the pain and fear that's driving them so that in more and more corners and settings and activities, we are able to consciously move in a way that brings peace and harmony and love and fairness and justice and all these yummy things because, not because we all want to be good doobies and get good grades but because we love God and we are eager and willing to be remade um, in that, in their image, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a moving from personal will to a divine will, right? Which is like moving from living like a ferret. <laughs> a ferret. <laughs> you get or, uh, you know, I got to get my nuts. I got to bury my nuts. I got to make sure I survive. I got to do things to be a good one and make sure my me survives, you know, and, mm, 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 to really, what would you have me? How can I serve in this moment? What would you have me do? What is the most true, whether it benefits me personally, my bank account, my body, my tribe, or not? What is the highest use? of this, which, you know, often ends up that it's not like we, we go hungry or we, you know, the old models of, you know, starving yourself so that you can feed your neighbor, you know, all that stuff, like work to the, all that old idea of sacrifice. It's still, sometimes we're asked, you know, just go to the back of the line and to be comfortable at the back of the line or the front of the line, being comfortable as the pauper or the king, being surrendered to how the holy wind wants to move our sailboat 
and to be open no matter whether it brings us fame or uh, infamy, I guess is the other the other word, right? <laughs> or or no fummy at all, no F-A-M, just unknownness, you know? Mm-hmm. So what does it look like on a practical level, right? Because that's the where the rubber meets the road. What? How does this become practical, having presence as the foundation of, I mean, it is the foundation of everything, but living as presence. Yeah. That is well, the practical way to make that a reality. Well, one is um, to be very curious and question um, what we have all taken to be true, to start to question, who am I? What is this that looks out of these eyes? Who is this? Is this genie? Or is there something prior to genie witnessing all the geniness? And to be really curious about that. And when I was going through the dark night of the soul and suffering my butt off, I would frequently, I was looking for what can I depend on? And so I would, in a moment, just break everything down. What is there? What is there? If everything I'm building the world out of is simply sensations firing places in my brain, then all I can say is something is ising, not a thing, but is. Is is ising. And it's like this. And down below thought, I I started dropping out of thought because thought was unreliable. And I started exploring the world of the building blocks, presence and sensation. And when I would get going, luckily, not didn't feel lucky at the time, my mind was going so crazy trying to solve my life because my life was falling apart and I didn't understand why and meaning had drained from the world, et cetera. Um, I was both questioning, what am I? But also what's real, what's dependable? If everything is built on top of this essential kind of alphabet of experience, presence, sensations woven together into a world, I think I will abide down here near the origin Uh, loosening up my addiction to creating a world with problems that I can go solve. So some questioning is very useful. Um, Another thing that's useful is to find the teachers, the places, the activities, the practices that allow us to get a glimpse of ourselves beyond just this personal self that allow us to have a moment of just being here wide open, feeling more like a cloud of presence than a it body. Um, And then, you know, I asked uh, my teacher, Adi Shanti, what, what, how, how does someone like me use someone like you? Mm -hmm. And he said, take what opens in my presence and give your attention to it. And so I would say the same thing that, um, as we explore, as we practice, however we practice, and there are lots of different ways to practice, and you can pick your favorite one, (laughs) but anything that sort of lets us step away from being, taking so seriously this me that needs to be good and needs to win arguments and needs to get there and needs to survive, and to step back into resting wide open and allowing the flow of experience simply to flow through as we rest back in abiding um, and having some kind of support for that. You were talking about uh, my program, the Holy Work Challenge, which is uh, tomorrow is day 30 of it. And uh, for 30 days, like we support, the, the group enters and it's like a hot house of support for whatever practice as part, there's seven aspects, right? And people pick what calls to them. Uh, Some people just pick acknowledging the holy. Some people pick dropping into felt experience and spending some time there. There's, And there's support for making a commitment, for leaning in, 
for noticing you lean out and leaning back in um, because a lot of us will go, yay, yay, let's practice. And then three days later, we've forgotten it. And so this is why there's Sangha. This is why there's spiritual communities. This is why there's monasteries. But these days, there's so many of us who are householders. We need some kind of monastery that kind of coexists with our lives. If we're parents, et cetera, we can't all just run off to the hills. And we don't need to run off to the hills. If we have some protected space, maybe we go on a retreat now and then. But when we have reminders and we have support and we have companionship, to keep returning to the exploration of what am I essentially and how much of all this blah, blah, blah do I actually need to be here in a good way? Um, So, you know, the way that I teach, the practice I teach includes felt experience for a so many reasons. But one is it's a docking place for our attention other than thought. It's a very, we may not know what is presence. I don't know, you know, but we know what squeezing our cheek feels like. We know what uh, breath moving in and out of the body feels like. And that can be an anchor point for us to start to see how busy the mind is and how much we build tomorrow and yesterday and me going to some destination out of thoughts in the head and to come back to now, come back to now, come back to now, come back to now. And that's beautiful to watch people discover that life exists below thoughts about life and that we can find some relief and some peace and start to um, unfold our essence in a life lived from essence simply by returning here again and again and again. Mm-hmm. Yes. I like the felt sense as well, because I feel just sitting here, you know, resting my hands on my thighs, there's sensation, right? And where sensation is, is where the formless is meeting the form and there's awareness. And this is what presence is experiencing now. And if I put my attention on what presence is experiencing, and drop back in as that presence, it's it's like, for me, it feels like a shortcut or it's a, a pathway. Yeah. And you know, the way that I discovered to do that was simply because my mind was driving me crazy. My life was falling apart. Meaning was fading. The world turned into an underworld and I had no idea why. And I had no idea what to do. And no one was able to even look at me and say, I know what's happening with you until I met some spiritual teachers and found St. John of the Cross's book, Dark Night of the Soul. And so all that I noticed was that if I dropped my attention, I was very pregnant and I would go down to this creek and lie by the creek on the earth because somehow my body felt soothed by that. And I would take a little break from my manic mind trying to solve my life and just bury my attention in the ripples in the water and the leaves as they waved, and the feel in my body, which was not pleasant at the time, because I was very frightened. But into that world of simplicity, the world that the trees and the earth and the water all living out without conflict, and to just rest there. And so I started just plunging my attention into things as they are, into the flow of experience, into the feel and the sound. And I would notice that the tremendous amount of suffering would abate some. It didn't mean that I wasn't afraid. It didn't mean that I didn't have grief rise, but the whole secondary giving myself a hard time, the panic about figuring it out started to leave because I could feel my feet were on the ground and come what may in this moment, I'm actually all right. I'm actually all right. I started to really replace the fear that everything was going to go into the you know, gutter, um, everything, I was going to just rot and die. I started replacing that fear with the actual experience. Oh, here I am. Here's another breath. Now, what is the very next thing to do? And now that's just how I live. (laughs) Mm. Like my attention came to things as they are 
And now that's where it abides, just here. I'm so grateful for you sharing your experience. And that's how I found you when I was going through a similar experience and so uh, helped me a great deal. I think the the main thing that helped was you sharing that the experience was one level of suffering and then there was that second level of suffering that came from the narrative that you were telling yourself about. Yes, yeah. as, as if we're not already scared enough, the mind has to whip up <laughs> lots of extra levels of freak out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was huge for me too, because I know what it's like to live in a wounded animal body that was, that my animal creature body was freaking out and it was a painful place to reside. But the stories about never getting better or having to live with that for the rest of my life were excruciating. Yeah. And not true. (laughs) Well, I, at one point really, you know, after four years and, and it took about five years to lift um, after about four years, it it was like, okay, okay. This is just how it's going to be. I don't know what this is, but here I just gave up. I was like, okay. And that's when it started to lift. And I have to say, in a way, I'm still in the dark night. It's just not a problem anymore. Mm-hmm. And by that, I mean that I completely surrendered to the fact that I, as a separate me, well, not only don't exist, but am mastered by the holy, the holy one, and is living my life. And Jeannie doesn't live here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> And I was trying to master, you know, I was trying to make life um, adhere to my ideas of how it should be. And uh, that was no longer an option here. And and the holy let me think that I was in charge for quite a long time, because all of my efforts did seem to work for quite a long time. And then at some point, it was like, a, hey, guess what? You're not the boss. <laughs> Yeah. And I want to say one thing about presence that's very lovely. And this is part of, we do a lot of partner practice and there's a book written about, I don't, can't recall the title, but a man put forth a theory that what Rumi and Shams were doing was a gazing practice. Mm -hmm. And that that's what they were getting together to do was to gaze. And a lot of, um, a lot of people are using gazing and There is something about sitting together in silence, um, being and being together. And when a field is held by a teacher and prompts and uh, pointers are given, and we spend days in that kind of place, whether it's an online retreat, a class, or an in-person retreat, um, we can start to resonate and deepen as a group, because we are all conduits of this. We are all this one presence and we assist each other. I have a teacher and friend who says um, we are ladders for God to God for each other. And by that, it means that we are lending our resting capacity uh, to others. And you can feel, I'm sure you can feel in your small group, um, you can feel the presence of the group deepening and growing as we spend time abiding in presence. And uh, that's a tremendously supportive um, vehicle if people are interested in um, opening to and surrendering to presence is finding uh, a group that has integrity (laughs) and is exploring these things. Yeah, what you shared earlier about structure and um, how it's built with integrity and layer to with the right intention. Um, that's what's been happening. And, you know, I can see that it's been happening through me. I'm not the one do I'm not I didn't go, I'm going to do this and then this and then this. It was just really following the feedback of the field and taking the next step and the next. And now looking back, I can see that a yeah. vehicle is being constructed for yeah. presence to occupy and reveal. And um, the bonds are being strengthened each week and 
Yeah, it's beautiful. And there's another Persian practice called Sobat. You, you mentioned um, Rumi and the gazing practice. There's another one about just what we're doing, having deep conversation that is a similar, even though we're using words and so forth, there's a, this might be, you know, more easy for people to drop into first is to just have these conversations. Cause I feel like for me, I realized that there was something missing and I was feeling melancholy and I, I had taken a break from doing any kind of interviews or having any of these conversations. And then I had a conversation with a friend and we went into a really adventurous um, direction. And afterwards I was like, oh, this is it. This is, this is medicine. Yeah. It's like a supplement, right? That um, yeah. we, the, a part of this feel needs for the circulation to um, not only circulate within my field, but to um, network with other fields around the world, because there's a lot of international connections. And um, yeah, I think sometimes that that feeling of a longing is, is there to stimulate the opening for what is uh, seeking connection to itself through you to another version of itself to build this vehicle that's it's constructing for its um, purpose of giving. Yeah. Yeah. I'm about to do a call on uh, resonance mm -hmm. and sort of listening to what resonates, what feels alive in order to um, live a life of the truth, to start to develop the sensibilities to tell you know, the mind can say, oh, that sounds so good. Oh, that sounds so good. The words are right. Resonance is more like the energy of something. Like, it's almost like yum, yum, that's food. <laughs> and uh, as a way to sort of follow, uh, it, it, it seems that to follow what resonates, the true next steps are what help this to unburden and learn and grow into what it, what it's here to grow into. Yes, I love that you use the word food because there is that um, hunger for something that presence feeds that nothing else can can satiate. I can remember just I can remember just praying to be used. I I I am. Um, was always following, not my whole life, following some line of questioning, development, inquiry, exploration, moving from martial arts to uh, working on my stuff to reading Carl Jung and, you know, just reading the stories of the saints with this just deep hunger and interest in the potential of a human being, the way it sat here was sort of like the potential of a human being to be love, to be true, to be whole, to be an extension of the holy. To, to And it, I didn't always have a sense of a deity because I went through my own, you know, bouts with atheism. And I grew up with a Catholic mom and an atheist dad who now calls himself an agnostic and my mom doesn't go to church anymore, <laughs> but they sure looked uh, a lot. They looked like two poles at the time when I was young and finding my way through all that, whether it was philosophers, you know, uh, the history of psychology, just kind of, and I think a lot of us are just tuned that way. We, we want to discover I like the way some indigenous people say how to be here in a good way. Cause it's like such a simple way of saying it, how to be here in a good way. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here in a good way with me today. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great name for a podcast being here in a good way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Thank you, Cindy. It's always a pleasure to delve into these things together. It's great. It is. And hopefully it's been enriching to those of you listening in. And so we'll be doing more of these. So there'll be more richness coming and we'll decide what the topics are when the time comes. Seems to be our way. So thank you, Jeannie. And thank you all for tuning in. And um, yeah, if you want to put a comment and let us know what you want to hear about, we'll t- definitely take your suggestions as well. <laughs> Yay. Thank awesome. you. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.